Okay, it's Q&A time. Now, this is the first Q&A I've done on this channel, so hopefully it will go well, and if you find it useful, then tell me in the comments and I can do more. Um, I've had a nice bunch of questions, which I haven't read all of them yet, so some of them are gonna be a bit of a surprise, but uh, hopefully I will know the answers, um, and I'll do my best. But thank you to everyone who has, firstly, sent me in questions via YouTube, Instagram, email, um, all kinds of different ways they've been coming at me. It's been great, so thank you for that. Really appreciate that. And secondly, thank you to everyone who's been buying my presets. Um, they're linked below if you um, haven't got them and want them. It's so good to see you buying them, and yeah, I hope they're useful to you. Um, I'm, I use them all the time, so hopefully um, you will too. Now, let us get into the questions. Okay, so I'm gonna, I've got them all in here on the iPad, um, and I will just go through them one at a time, and hopefully this will be helpful to you, um, and hopefully we're all gonna learn something, <laughs> even me, while I read this. I have to say quickly, just before I get started, your comments, and I meant this when I put this on Instagram, the comments that you guys put in on my videos, they're so helpful. Um, I actually learn quite a lot from you guys. When I'm, if I'm doing something, do a video, and you post stuff about you know what I've got wrong or what I've got right or whatever, it's brilliant because actually you do it in such good spirit, and it's so great to be on um, a YouTube channel where the people that watch my videos are actually really good people, and what comes back from you is just just really helpful and and really great. So thank you so much for for that. Um, but yeah, let's let's see if we can get through some of these questions and see how we go. So, firstly, this is from Instagram, um, from someone called No Clue. I'm assuming that isn't their actual name. Um, so, hi Chris, would you say that the X-Trans 2 sensor is your most preferred sensor, and is the XE2 one of your favorite cameras for personal projects and in general? Whew, there's a question for you. Is the XE2 and the X-Trans 2 my favorite? I wouldn't say it's my absolute favorite. I'd say that for me, and I think it's up here somewhere, yeah. I think my favorite XE camera is the XE1. Um, even though, <laughs> it's funny really, because it's the most basic in terms of, you know, our menu systems and the whole thing is just old, but, I absolutely adore the X-Trans 1 sensor. Now, I love the X-Trans 2 sensor. They're my two favorite sensors, but I think if I was gonna grab one camera, then it would be the XE1. I just, there's something about that sensor that it's hard to even put into proper words what it is, but for me, there's a soul in the XE1. There's a soul in the X-Trans 1 sensor, which I love. That soul is also in the X-Trans 2. So, you know, I've got the XE2 up there. Um, and I love that as well. Um, it's definitely got faster autofocus. But yeah, if I was gonna grab one camera, it would probably be the um, XE1. Would you recommend the XC35, even though I own the XF35 1.4 uh, from Bear Tribe Alex? I think that's on um, Instagram as well. So would I recommend buying the XC35? Now the XC35, I think, is on my XE1. Yeah, here it is. So this, if you haven't seen it before, this is the XC35 um, lens. Now, the, it's really interesting because Fujifilm have brought out this XC range a while ago, but this, I think, is their latest, um, their latest lens in it. And the F2 lenses at Fuji, I think, are just beautiful. There's something about the sole in those and the contrast in those lenses that I don't even find in my 1.4, 1.6, 1.2 lenses, even though they're clearer and maybe a bit more clinical, which is great for like commercial stuff or weddings or whatever. I find that the F2 lenses have just got something about them, which if I was going to choose a lens, it would always be an F2 lens from Fujifilm. And so for me, if you are going to go out and, you're, and you've got the 1.4 and you're thinking, should I get the, the other one? I would, because it's £169 and I think that is a very reasonable price for a lens. And it's lighter, it's smaller. And so if you are going to be you know, walking around with it, it would save you some weight. 
Now I know there's a, a legendary kind of feel about the 1.4 and I've not used that. So, you know, only you're gonna know. But personally, I would always buy the F2 lenses, even if I had all the other lenses, because I, I, I love, absolutely love them. Um, hi Chris, my question is, if you are photographing a landscape and are spot metering, where would you take the exposure from? Ah, oh, this is from my recent um, spot metering made simple, or whatever it was called. Yes, now I will show you. Basically, this is what happens with the spot metering. If you are, if you're, if you're spot metering, so therefore, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with that, you can go back and look on one of my videos recently. Basically, on the X-T3, you've got here your dials, which you can just turn, and the one there with the spot is spot metering. And what that does, that takes a reading, an exposure reading, from just 2% of the frame. Now the other ones, like the average and the multi, they take from a larger area and, and from different places, but the spot gives you complete control to choose from 2% of the area. But what happens is, is that there are two options for this. So this, the question is really about the, um, uh, where is it? The question is, where would you take the exposure from? That's because in the Fujifilm menu system, if you were to go down to the AFMF, and then go all the way down and keep going, you get to something called interlock spot AE and focus area, either on or off. Now, if you put that on, what that does is that locks together your exposure and your focusing in the same place. So that wherever you move, the, I see on the X-T3 here, wherever you move the joystick around, and as you move it around um, and you move your AF point around, you will notice that your spot metering is basically uh, locked in to your exposure and so to your focus point. So wherever you're moving your focus point around, your the uh, camera's taking the meter reading at the same time from the same place. Now, if you don't want it to do that, so if you want to focus in one area, but take the reading from another area, the only other option is to turn that off and then what the camera will do is it will take it from the center of the sensor. And so you could then focus wherever you want and then the spot will come from the center of the frame. So your options really are, with spot metering, there are two options. You either take the reading from the center or you take the reading from wherever you're focusing. And they're really what you've got on options for. Now I tend to leave that on and I tend to lock my, um, sent, lock my focus point to my exposure point and so I can then see wherever I'm focusing um, you know basically it's locked together and I find that generally works okay um, but you can take it from the center if you want to okay uh, next question from that was from Doug by the way thanks Doug um, next one Sherpa 68 I'm assuming <laughs> this is Instagram again would you say the x trans sensors are better sensors um, I know you just got an x100 up there I think and it's a different sensor but wondered what your thoughts were yes I would say the X trans sensors are better than well they probably are better than the original sensor that came with the um, X100 I love the X trans sensors I got into Fujifilm firstly because I love the way they looked that <laughs> was my kind of eye candy the, the way the cameras looked but once I played with them and started to use them it was the X trans sensors that kept me in Fujifilm you know, because actually when I first got into it, I was so used to using Canons that the menus were all kind of weird and it was like, how on earth do I get used to this? And um, even editing the shots was kind of strange at first because they the raw files handled so differently from the Canon one. So everything about it was kind of odd at first, but it was the sensors that kept me. And it was that analog look. It was that beautiful way that the um, Fujifilm sensors handle situations, especially when you're shooting people or you're shooting um, in the early days, you know, in the kind of earlier sensors, there's if we, when I shoot a landscape with it, there's just something kind of really um, analog about the look of the sensors. Now, obviously, those sensors have developed over time. So you've got the one, two, three and the four. And I've got the X-Trans 4 in the X-T3 here. And it's a very good sensor. It's really clean. It's, you know, it's very commercial in its look and which is great for my commercial work, but I don't use it for 
say shooting landscapes, I would shoot, I, I would use the XE1 probably, or I've recently been using the X100. And they're my two kind of go-to landscape ones because I want that slightly more dirtier look. So I would, yes, I love X-Trans sensors and I just, you know, I would just keep buying Fujifilm cameras forever. One of the great things about Fujifilm is they make so many and I'll just keep buying their cameras, especially the older ones, because each one has something about it which just brings something different out of me um, in my, my photography. Okay, uh, next question. This is from John. He says, my wife and I last summer decided to sell our Sony gear and switch to Fuji. We both have an XS10 and various lenses, which means we have much more expensive gear than we had before, especially when you add in the two three-legged thing tripods we bought. Without making this email too long, we wondered whether it's worth getting photography specific insurance, and if so, do I have any recommendations of companies and a ballpark of what we should look to pay without being ripped off? Right, well, I think this depends on what country you're in, because obviously I think your insurance will be country specific to, to where you are. So I can only really speak for my experience um, in the UK. I use, and I think I've always used, PhotoGuard. I found them really useful. I think they are part of Thistle Insurance. I can't remember completely, but I know that on my bank statements, every now and then, you know, you, the kind of name changes. And I think it's Thistle, but they're called PhotoGuard and you can put that into into Google and find it. And I found them really, really um, helpful. And when I, when I have had equipment go wrong, they've been great at sorting that for me really quickly. So I can definitely, from my experience, I've got no you know affiliation with them, but I, I would say they've been good with me. Um, I'd also say that price-wise, it's hard to say because it depends on the amount of gear. My insurance covers a lot of gear and also the liability insurance for, for my commercial work, etc., etc. So it's kind of, I can't really compare the insurance prices, but I'd say they're definitely worth a look and you will get a good idea and um, how much it would be per month or per year um, if you, you went with them. Sorry, I can't be more specific on that, but it's hard to know without really knowing what your, um, the amount of gear um, you've got. Um, okay, this is from, that's from John. This is from Rob Jackson. Um, God bless you, Chris. Do you ever suffer from depression? If so, do you find photography gets you to a better place in your mind? This I'm assuming is from my um, mental health video I did a few weeks ago. Um, I don't suffer from depression, no. That's thankfully something, never anything I've had to deal with. I have suffered from mental health issues, which I would say is slightly different because my, my general makeup is a happy um, quite excitable makeup. So I tend to be quite upbeat and quite buoyant um, in life. I think when I've faced major challenges, um, that, like everybody, affects my mental health and I've had to deal with that and get through that. But I think possibly the buoyance of my inner Tigger, <laughs> to quote Winnie the Pooh, um, has helped to keep me, you know, moving forward. Um, I have found photography to be the most helpful thing. Um, and I've got, those of you who haven't seen it, just here. This is the book that I shot as I kind of went through a whole period of about five years of struggling with um, mental health issues, dealing with the kind of experiences from the past to help me get through that phase. Um, and you have to watch that video to really understand that. Um, I shot this book and this is all basically shots from my journeys around remote Britain and I sought out lots of remote areas where I just loved being um, and then whilst I was there um, I was just photographing and walking and you know I'm, I'm quite a contemplative person so I enjoy that so yes I'd say photography is massively helpful to mental health um, and has really helped me to to kind of move on from that in my life um, okay this is from IZ Memory IZ Memories, Instagram. Um, hey Chris, since I love black and white, what are your best tips that you can share with us? Thank you so much. Well, I think probably the best way to look at the black and white one is, I've just done, I think, two videos on black and white. I did one the other day on the, um, the black and white 
filters that come with the Fujifilm cameras, the yellow, the red, and the blue, no, yellow, red, and green. <laughs> they don't have blue and orange, which has been, things have been asked recently. Um, but yeah, those three, and also I did one before on the black and whites with, um, I think I used the XE1 and the XE2. So hopefully those videos will give you something. I guess off the top of my head, my initial thing is always, personally, I would use spot metering, and I would use, um, I would use the black and white in, um, the camera um, and then that would give you a good idea of even if you're shooting on raw file shoot in black and white even though it will come out color on the computer just so it gives you an idea of exactly what you're getting and then just go for those areas of proper contrast you know I like a black and white to be black and white to have like major highlights major blacks so it really does give you that light and dark um, contrast big shadows um, sometimes I love a bit of blown out sky or blown out, you know, on the um, on black and whites because it kind of creates an impact. Um, I never know why people get upset when you blow out highlights on images because sometimes it's really fun and it actually, you know, it can look really cool. But in the you know, it's up to you. It's your own thing. But I'd say yeah, go for the major blacks, major whites, big contrasty images. I find spot metering um, is great for that. And put your camera in a black and white mode that would give you an idea of exactly what you're what you're shooting. But yeah, watch those videos, hopefully they will help. Um, okay, this is from Janez Struckels. Sorry, it's Instagram, so it's hard to know. Um, how do you like Fuji X Pro cameras? You rarely talk about them. Do you know, that's true. And you know, just yesterday, I was looking on MPB at buying a X Pro One. Um, and so I haven't done it yet, but I'm looking, I was toying, toying between the um, X-Pro1 and another camera that's got an X-Trans3 sensor. Because you know, the one sensor I haven't got is the X-Trans3. So I'm, I'm tying between the different cameras. So hopefully soon I will have something to say about an X-Pro1, two or three or whatever, we'll see. Um, I'd like to know what you guys think about the X-Pro1, two and three, which one's the kind of um, the one that's the best, because that would help me in terms of which one to get. Um, okay, another one from XF Tales. Hey, would you ever try one camera, one lens, one year? Ooh. It's a great way of developing as a photographer, expanding your mind and ideas. I think you would enjoy it. I like the idea of that. One camera, one lens, one year. <laughs> I don't know how I could cope without buying new ones um, and without having lots of, lots of cameras. Um, if I was going to do it, I would use... I think if I was going to do one camera, one lens, one year, I would use the X100. Partly because I've just bought it and I, you know, I'm kind of still loving it. But there's something about that setup of the X100 that just feels like so complete. And I was out doing um, uh, a, a kind of mentoring session the other day and we were down um, by the sea and I was turning on the, you know, the ND filter and I was just... The whole thing works so well as a one piece bit of equipment that's just, you, you've got one lens, you've got one camera, you know, it does kind of lend itself to that. So that's what I would use if I was going to do it. Whether I would do it or not, I don't know. Um, okay, this is from a Gramitozumo. So sorry, I'm getting these names wrong, but these are all Instagram names, so it's hard. Um, hey Chris, have you experimented with pinhole photography using speciality lenses on Fujifilm cameras? If so, are there settings you can share for getting decent exposures? Now, I have done some pinhole photography, but I did it using a cardboard camera that I made. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but I did create, um, in fact, I made more than one. Um, and uh, I did it with my kids and I created, I don't even know if I've got any of the pictures anymore but we created a pinhole camera out of um, some cardboard and basically took a picture of our house. Um, I bought some some kind of uh, film that you just put in the back and you've, it's so fun, honestly. It takes an hour or so to make the camera, maybe a bit, maybe a bit more, and it's quite fiddly, um, but once you've done it and you've got it and you buy the kind of pack of film, you just, you know, and, I, and actually I developed it using was it basil or oregano? I can't remember, but it was like, or was it mint? I can't remember. Anyway, it was, I think it might be mint. Um, it was basically a, 
organic um, herbal type of um, developing method. Um, I went right, you know, almost like vegan, <laughs> vegan developing. The idea was to basically make a picture out of a bit of cardboard and not use any chemicals. So I just bought all this kind of like stuff that was really natural. And I used the airing cupboard. Um, it was the darkest place in our house. And I went in the garden and we basically took away the um, the front, which basically exposes the lens, <laughs> a bit of cardboard, into it. And um, maybe we experimented like 20, 30 seconds, a minute, different time of lengths until we've kind of worked out what the best exposure was for the hole that we'd made. And uh, yeah, we got a picture of our house, a black and white image, really fun, definitely worth doing. I've not done it with Fujifilm. I've not done it with any of these kind of speciality lenses, so I can't speak to that, but I would definitely recommend pinhole photography. Absolutely hilariously fun. Um, okay, this is from Christopher A. What are your favorite photography spots in the UK? Well, Difficult question because that whole book is full of different places. Um, I'm going soon to one which might end up being my favourite spot. I'm going to the furthest you can go in UK waters before you leave the UK, um, which is like two planes and a boat ride um, called St Kilda. And uh, I'm going there this year. Um, I've tried for three years to get there, but every time the weather has um, stopped me. Um, so hopefully that will become a cool place. Um, I think if I was going to pick one place to go to, I would either pick Linda's Farm. I've done videos on that recently, or it would be um, Hebridean Islands. Could be... Um... That's my phone. Sorry. <laughs> Turn that off. Um, it could be... I would either Sky or further out to um, Isle of Harris Lewis. I don't know, I love Scotland. I love the Hebrides. Um, you know, oh, he said spots rather than spot. Perfect, I can choose a few. Right, let's go for um, Outer Hebrides, Isle of Barra, Isle of Lewis, Isle of Harris, amazing Outer Hebrides. Sky is incredible. Um, let's go for the um, Linda's Farm. Basically, if you can get to the edges of our country at the top, you're in for an absolute treat in terms of light and mountains and just incredibleness. But obviously the Lake District is amazing, as is Cornwall. <laughs> There's so many good spots in this country. Um, but yeah, hopefully they're helpful. Um, and he carries on, more questions. In your opinion, what is a mindful way of photography? For example, I don't really enjoy it post-processing. So I started to get shots in JPEGs to reduce the complexity of the post. Um, and he carries on saying, what do you do with a huge amount of photos on a hard drive? Making photo books seems to take ages and decision making is hard and it stresses me out. So a few questions there. Right, a mindful way of taking photos, I would say is to start by walking and not taking photos, okay? So you get to a location, the first thing you'd kind of do is rush out and take pictures. Well, I would say, a mindful way of doing it is just to go and to just walk and enjoy that process of the walking and soaking in the atmosphere. Whether you're in a city doing street work, whether you are um, in a landscape doing a landscape, whatever you're doing, enjoy the environment first. Listen to the environment, you know, smell the environment, just get the whole senses going and that helps you be mindful. And then from there, take pictures of things that you are beginning to notice and things that you're beginning to see. Don't take too many pictures, you know, take your time over the composition, looking, seeing what you're seeing. Don't just rush and click. Try and limit yourself. Sometimes I limit myself to what would you would be a film. So I'd say, right, I've got 24 pictures for this whole shoot. And then um, limit myself to that. That can be really fun to do that. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, JPEGs can be good to reduce if you don't need a raw file. I, I shoot raw files just because, personally, um, I like having the, the range of, of um, the amount of colors that come with a raw file. And then if I'm applying my presets to those, um, I like to, I, mean, I, I you can apply them to the JPEGs as well, um, but I like to apply them to the raw file because there's more depth in that. Um, so yeah, but that's obviously up to you. Um, what do I do with the large amount? I'm quite good at culling my photos. So when I come back from a shoot, I'm really harsh and I chop them up really quickly and get down to the one or two pictures that I love. You've got to be really harsh with yourself and just say, right, of this shoot, really how many pictures are saying exactly the same thing? 
And if you can look at it honestly and go, you know what, there's 20 pictures here, they're all basically the same thing, then get rid of most of them and just keep the one. You know, you've got to be really harsh. If not, get someone else to look at them for you and they can say to you, look, you know what, five of these are rubbish, two of them are great, one of them is amazing, keep those three, get rid of those ones. And just try and do that as a, as a, a bit of a habit and that will help you get them down. Um, if you're going to do a book, pick your absolute best photos. Otherwise, you can you can kind of water down the great images with average images and then nobody will notice the really great images. So I like to really, really be strong and, and, and harsh with myself. Um, my wife's really good at being harsh with my photos and I love that. You know, she's really good at saying they're not good enough. That one's the one. And 99.9% .9 of the time she's right. Even if at first I don't agree with her, then I realized, yep, yeah, actually she was right. She's got a really good eye. So find someone with a really good eye who can help you do that. Um, okay, we're getting to the end. Uh, LC7GT, <laughs> Instagram. Um, okay, it says, hello, or yellow. Um, what is the place you'd most like to visit for photography anywhere in the world or maybe out of this world? Oh, interesting. I would say the place I really want to go to and I am trying to get to at the moment looking at um, is I want to go to, I think it's called Svalbard. It is basically um, further into the Arctic Circle than I've been. I've been into the Arctic Circle and I've loved photographing icebergs and that kind of thing. Um, I've I've been into the Arctic Circle twice um, and I am looking to go again even nearer up to the pole um, you know somewhere where I, I want to shoot proper big icebergs that are like portraits in themselves so I would love to do that I would love to go over to um, New Zealand and to shoot in New Zealand um, or parts of Australia um, those islands and the kind of areas out there there's a lot of places in Africa I'd like to visit I've got loads of places I really want to get to um, but yeah, they're just some of the ones off the top of my head. Um, I think I'd rather stay in this world. <laughs> the more I see of like space and Mars and all that, I think Earth, Earth just looks a lot nicer. Um, so yeah, I think I'd rather stay here. Um, right. Hey Chris, what is your in-camera recipe film simulation for black and white on my XE1? Well, I actually shoot raw. Um, for as, Even if I am going to have it on the black and white setting, I actually shoot in raw still and then I apply um, either one of my black and white presets to it afterwards, or I just go in and create a new one and find a way um, of making that picture look like it's supposed to, um, like I want it, and I mess about with all of the different settings and the colors and all that um, for the different filters. But yeah, I tend to shoot raw all the time. Um, so yeah, that's what I would do with that. Um, and the last two, um, this from Grey Area Photo. Really excited for the q and A. I I also have a family, wife and three kiddos. Do you have any practical things that you can do to maintain your passion for photography amidst the chaos of parenting? <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, it is chaotic. I've got a nine year old, 11 year old, 13 year old. So, you know, life does get chaotic and there are times that it's really hard to get out and shoot. You know, maybe you want to go in the morning and photograph a landscape and it's school time. It's just not going to work. And so, you've got to just find a balance for that. Now in that chaos, what I have done is I've given my children cameras, GoPros, a drone, everything. I basically, whatever's mine over the years, I've just shared with them. So they got a kind of a piece of my photography life, practically, not just in the kind of, they can come with me and watch. My son's got, you know, a GoPro 7, he's got my uh, Mavic drone, he's got an XE2, my, um, Daughters have got GoPros, have got um, uh, Fujifilm cameras um, and other cameras, and they've all got something or multiple things which they can make videos and photos with. So when we go, they can bring everything and create and take some amazing photos. And so I find that that helps to keep it, rather than me and them separately, it keeps it us. So then when we do go, it's kind of a joint thing. It's a, a fun thing, a family thing. That's one way of keeping the passion alive as well. Because actually, if you're kind of in it together as a family, it keeps that passion going. Now, if your kids are a bit small for that, I don't know what age yours are, um, then I think you've just got to find a balance of when you're out, when you're in. Sometimes escaping for a bit and doing some landscape work is lovely. 
peaceful, um, but you don't want to leave carnage behind. Um, otherwise, you know, you can't enjoy that when you're out knowing it's chaos at home. So you've just got to find a balance. But the way that I've done it is to try and bring them with me and make it a family thing um, as much as I can. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, and the last one, am I right to say that these coloured filter settings are irrelevant when shooting RAW? This goes back to my video the other day, um, my last video, which was about the um, the Fujifilm yellow, red and green filters in your black and white settings. Now, yeah, when you're shooting RAW, I guess initially what would happen is, is that it's going to convert it, obviously to, it's going to stay a colour image, um, even if you're shooting it in black and white. Um, but I know that Capture One and Lightroom have the Fujifilm simulation profiles now in them for, for raw files. So you could still go in and, and load that profile. Um, now, whether or not that would keep to the yellow, green and red, I'm not sure, probably not. Um, but it's worth having a look and seeing if those profiles do specifically have those three options. Um, but yeah, you might have to shoot it um, as a JPEG to have that like that, um, to, to really keep those settings. Um, or just have it in the raw file so you can see what the effect is doing and then go after in post-processing and just change your red, yellow and green um, on the uh, the sliders um, in, in the black and white mix for um, Lightroom. So yeah, that's probably going to be the case. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for watching if you've hung on to the end. Um, if you found this helpful, do let me know in the comments and do keep sending me questions and I will keep doing these um, as often as I get a good amount of questions um, to answer. But yeah, hope it's been helpful to you. It's been fun for me. Um, yeah, and I'll see you soon. Cheers.